Um, welcome everyone to our webinar today. Uh, Simon and I will be talking for about the next 40 to 45 minutes and we welcome your questions. We also encourage you to ask questions as you go along. We'll be collating those as we go to make sure we don't miss any at the end. So those are our pictures. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, the research report that we're going to be talking about, but also position it within the research that we do here at OCLC. Since 1978, OCLC has had a division called OCLC Research, uh, which is dedicated to, in a way, sort of expanding the research on behalf of libraries because we know that all of you in the work that you do don't necessarily have the capacity to do that. So a lot of our job is to scale research and learning on behalf of research libraries. Uh, and that's the work that Marilee and I get to do on your behalf. And um, we also do that through engagement um, with OCLC members. Um, and we are a division here within OCLC. And so you can see through that we generate research like the type of research report that Simon and I are going to be talking about today. I joined OCLC Research about a year and a half ago and was asked by Lorcan Dempsey uh, to develop a program of research around research information management, acknowledging that this is a new area for libraries uh, and increasing sort of the important service category within the work that we do. So this is sort of an arc of the research that is underway. And the report that we're going to be talking about first here, uh, the, the research, um, the position paper on research information management is the first output of uh, several that we have lined up. Uh, and we have another one coming out hopefully this Thursday. That's the story, um, uh, an investigation of research information management along with um, the adoption and integration of persistent person and organizational identifiers. Uh, and then we also have a survey um, that we're conducting, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more about both of these at the, near the end of our talk. Today our focus is going to be on this publication. Um, this work also has been conducted in collaboration with OCLC research library partner organizations. Uh, and we have about 150 research libraries worldwide, including La Trobe, and that's how Simon and I came together in this working group of OCLC research library partners. Um, and we, uh, our working group had librarians from three different continents um, sharing our practices related to research information management. Uh, and through that, we, the partnership, we can have these types of working groups uh, we can do collaborative research together, and we can do webinars like this type of event we're having today. So on to the report. Uh, as you can see, we had a number of authors here who were collaborators on the working group, including Simon and, and others. Our goal with this research report um, was very much to talk, to better understand and provide framework for understanding research information management practices, uh, and it's also to help synthesize the ways that libraries are adding value and can and should add value. Uh, and part of the challenge for us was talking about research information management in a way that made sense for Europe and then made sense for the United States and Canada and Australia and New Zealand. And our goal was very much to come up with, uh, with models that could help us talk across those boundaries and to better understand the larger landscape of research information management. So what is research information management? Within this, this publication, we have defined it as the aggregation, curation, and utilization of metadata about research activities. Uh, there's a lot of terms that are in use. Uh, the one that's most commonly used in Europe uh, and perhaps also there in, in um, the Asia-Pacific areas are current research information systems or CRIS systems. Um, that's language that's almost, that's infrequently used in North America, where instead we tend to hear 
things like a researching networking system or research profiling system, or we might be focused on another part of the landscape, which is um, supporting faculty activity review or reporting, which is usually called FAR in, in the U.S. environment. These are all parts of that landscape. And so when we use the term research information management, we think of it as sort of a larger bucket that's holding all of these things, which may be a bit more specific uses, um, and that this is sort of a broader practice. Um, we do, we're talking about how institutions, research institutions, medical centers, research universities are collecting this information. So this is not about um, social networking platforms like ResearchGate or Academia.edu. Uh, and in the U.S. often I end up with some confusion, as, as Marilee well knows, um, with uh, another important emerging area for libraries, which is also research data management. So these are distinctive things. So I have two more slides, uh, and I want to go into a bit more uh, depth about each of these. Um, we defined in this report and tried to articulate the different kinds of metadata that may be included in research information management. And generally, if you're collecting some of this information, but, but not necessarily all of it, we're going to consider that you're collecting research, you're doing research information management. And notice that we're not necessarily saying that you have to have a REM system or a CRIS system. Um, we have cases where we see institutions that collect uh, a bibliography of their researchers or faculty members. Um, I would define that as a type of research information management because you're doing that process of aggregating and curating and hopefully reusing that information. So that's, that's, it's sort of the collection of the metadata and then the use of it that makes it research information management. So here to point to a few things, uh, traditionally we tend to think of publications, journal publications, monographs, um, increasingly, with um, there are more parts of the evolving scholarly record that are included here. So this is where data outputs go. Um, and we have patents uh, as well, I think, are a type of research output. But we sort of separated it out because it's usually managed perhaps in a different place at your institution. That's not uncommon. Um, and for many institutions, um, and I think like Simon's going to talk with Latrobe, is it may also be common for you to be collecting within your research information practices statements of impact or aggregate information about grants or projects or other types of uh, research support and funding uh, within this information. Um, certainly it has information about the researchers or faculty members their affiliations on campus, and we all want to know who they're collaborating with, who are they co-authoring with, um, that information. Traditional uh, CRIS systems typically don't include these two categories, instructional history or anything related to teaching, and they may also not include anything about the service component uh, that researchers and faculty members may engage with. Uh, and, uh, but this is even, um, I just returned from the Eurochrist meeting in um, Europe last week, uh, and we're increasingly seeing this type of information be, be collected within the European en environment as well. And finally, there also may be media reports that uh, some members of the campus community may also want to aggregate. Uh, because this is also a way for us understanding the impact of research for an institution. So that's all the information that may be included within this research information landscape. And it all depends upon what um, your uses may be. And so here is the second um, model that we put together to explain this landscape. Uh, it is again, you have your bucket of research information at the center, but it depends how you're using it depends upon what problems or challenges or needs your institution may be trying to address. 
for some institutions, it may be driven very much by needing to satisfy uh, external research uh, assessment processes. Um, or it may be to support, um, to create profiles for your researchers to help improve discovery uh, of researchers and their expertise, maybe internally as well as externally, and also to help manage the reputation. So you may have some type of public profile, like directory information, only richer. Um, some institutions are also tying this in with their research repositories. This seems to be becoming more common as we're seeing more open science um, and open access requirements or mandates. We also see this at institutions in the United States, uh, like Duke University, uh, where um, they are uh, collecting the metadata and also using research information management type functionality to help them track compliance with a university level open access requirement. Um, so it may be operating at the local or state level. Um, you may be using this uh, uh, and it may be driven by doing faculty activity reporting as it's far as it tends to be called in North America, uh, but more broadly, uh, uh, something called annual academic progress reviews where the, the typical workflows for assessing um, researchers' uh, performance that may be there. Of course, you have all this information, so it may be very valuable for internal reporting. There may be a component that's, that's sort of within or maybe it's just linked to information about grants and awards. We do see some cases where these are all bundled together, so we have that included there. And then finally, like the internal reporting piece, um, once you have all of this rich information, uh, there may be lots of ways to enable researchers to enter once and reuse often. So to populate uh, other researcher web pages, to help populate CVs or biosketches that may be used for um, grant proposals, uh, and maybe other populating other sort of central directories uh, and reuse for, for the researchers. So here is where I turn it over to Simon. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, so uh, as we said before, I'm Simon Huggett, I'm Deputy Director for Research and Collections at La Trobe University. I've been uh, at La Trobe for about five and a half years um, and had a history of um, dealing with repositories and research information management for some time. Uh, this is just a snapshot of our university. Um, it's the same age as me. Uh, those couple of pictures are from our Bundura campus, but we have uh, two uh, campuses in Melbourne, a city campus, Bundura campus, and we have um, four regional campuses in the state of Victoria, so spread out regionally, and we're uh, the biggest regional uh, university provider of education in Victoria. So what I wanted to cover is uh, that model um, around what La Trobe is doing and where, where the library uh, fits into that research information landscape. Um, so I'll just get my pointer to work here. I'll be look, talking a bit about the research repository that we have and where that fits in. And what I want to cover is uh, a couple of these areas where there's a, a, a double line showing a workflow, uh, because that's where, at the moment, the, the, the most activity is happening from what the library does, interacting with uh, what the university is doing in terms of managing uh, its research and wanting to improve uh, how we do that. So thinking of uh, strategic goals and, and where we're at um, on the next slide, the La Trobe University has, uh, I guess like a lot of other institutions, wants to um, improve its visibility of its research as well as the quality and the impact of its research. And the library has um, taken a a strong role in that part of, of enabling that information to be seen externally and to be uh, attributed to La, La Trobe researchers um, 
being done in a way that's efficient and, and well managed for the institution and really feeding into uh, improving where Latrobe sits in terms of its global rankings and its um, visibility of its, uh, of its research. And so a lot of those uh, strategic plans you can see on the slide there finish in 2017, but we now have a new strategic plan going forward for the next four years. And again, one of the really strong parts of our strategy that will continue is, is the area around supporting excellent research and improving research quality and impact. And this is where the library has a significant role in terms of being able to uh, do the work to help expose that re those research outputs and to feed information about them and use the uh, visibility of that material, the impact into our research information management and our reporting at La Trobe internally and externally. So there's a number of initiatives and projects going on that the uh, library is heavily involved in. Uh, we are uh, leading research data management initiatives, which are part of our digital research strategy. But our digital research strategy also includes uh, supporting excellent research and providing infrastructure to help uh, researchers do better research, which is uh, an important factor for the library in which we're involved. We uh, have an enterprise research data management project which finishes next year. But one of the major parts that the library has been involved in is a project called PRIME, which is a project for research information management enablement, which is really bringing together um, all of our research information management systems into one single interface or a dashboard and a, a, an area where we can bring together all that information for better reporting internally, better uh, coverage of what is happening with our research, uh, much better. Rebecca mentioned that issue of, of entering data once and reusing it. So um, the, the PRIME project found that we had 15 different research management systems around the institution that we want to bring together and manage them centrally in, and better in, in the one interface and avoid having to re-enter data and, and uh, report the same information in all these different systems at various times. So if we want our researchers to be engaged in promoting and uh, reporting on what they do and doing it in doing it well, we need to do that much better in a, in a much better centralised system. So we're in the middle of that project at the moment in re-evaluating what we do and the visibility of uh, the research management information that the library manages is, is right up there in the middle of this project. So just a couple of things around, I guess, external drivers. Um, government reporting is a big one for Australian institutions at the moment. The ERA process, which is the excellence for research in Australia reporting, which is uh, due in March 2018, um, is a big focus at the moment. And one of the, the, the uh, areas of focus for that reporting is uh, you know, uh, reporting on publications, which are research publications, which are el eligible to report to government to show uh, quality and, and impact of our research in our institutions. And that affects funding we get from the government. It's a highly visible process and an important process. And this year, uh, for the first time, we need to report accurately on open access uh, material that's uh, published openly on publishers' sites and in our repositories. Previously, we didn't have to report on what material was open access and what wasn't, and that really uh, is an important one because the the, uh, the major grant funding bodies in Australia are wanting to improve the impact of the research that they fund and want to make sure that our institutions are actually uh, ensuring that we follow those mandates, that research publications have to be made available as open access within 12 months of publication in a uh, publication. And each of our institutions are looking at our policies around open access and ensuring that we uh, make sure that we, we cover those mandates. And this is where the visibility of the, uh, the work that the library has done for some time around our repositories uh, is becoming much more uh, in focus, I guess. Uh, previously, we had a lot of trouble with academics depositing uh, material into our repositories, providing that metadata. Uh, because they didn't see the value of it. Um, 
and it, it, uh, it wasn't really that visible. They couldn't see why they needed to do that. Now it's all part of a, a much more integrated research landscape and it's really important for that to be reported accurately and done well across our whole institution and not just seen as a, a library thing that's done on the side. It's really central to managing our research information. So I just want to cover um, that diagram again, which Rebecca showed before, which was around um, the research information management uh, systems and different ways of using that research information across the institution. So um, I'll just start off with our research uh, repository. So La Trobe University has a, a repository called Research Online, which is a Fedora-based repository, which we've had since 2008, for quite some time. Uh, that repository has very much had an external focus in terms of publishing metadata about our research and providing open access material. But what's happened with looking at this in a more holistic sense across the institution, there's much more of a need to, to provide that metadata accurately and feed it into the internal research information systems uh, within the university. So in this central pool here, there's a workflow uh, for reporting that information back to our research information management system. And in fact, there's a two-way workflow in terms of providing that information centrally and providing it back to our uh, repository. And since um, 2015, we've been using the My Public, what we call the My Publication System, which is our symplectic elements implementation to harvest that metadata about uh, our research publications produced by our Latrobe researchers. And that's really changed the way we do things uh, in a really big way. Uh, the reason we've gone down that path of using uh, that type of system to harvest from our uh, information providers is to, again, that issue around uh, not wanting to uh, double handle that metadata and having to manually enter it and re-manually re enter it all the time and wanting to automate that and make it a, a much more simplified process for the researchers themselves so that they can um, claim their publications and uh, have them assigned to them within the systems at the Trobe in, a, in a, a seamless kind of way, which in some ways works well, in some ways is very complicated and, and uh, takes a lot of effort for the library to make that happen uh, in a seamless way, but I'll cover a bit more about that um, a little bit later. But some of the uses of that uh, metadata at La Trobe are you know, in, a, in a range of areas. So um, at La Trobe, there's a, a focus on academic workload planning uh, in that uh, researchers want to ensure that the research that they do is counted sufficiently so that they've got time to be able to allocate their workload between teaching their teaching that they do and the research that they do. Um, so it's an important part uh, here at La Trobe in terms of ensuring that the, the actual research that uh, the researchers do is properly accounted for in their time and their planning so that they, they can be more efficient and do more research, do better research, better quality research and spend less time uh, on administrative tasks. Um, it's also, that information also feeds into um, academic progression uh, reviews. It um, is also used in terms of uh, people applying for grants and awards where they need to be able to bring together all of their uh, research outputs and their citations and the impact of their research and being able to use that in, in grant applications. So that is also where that information is being reused at La Trobe. At the moment, uh, we're in the middle of, uh, as part of the PRIME project, which I mentioned before, we're in the middle of implementing a new um, external profile system. So at the moment, uh, when you look at a La Trobe researchers profile on the, the web pages at La Trobe. It includes metadata about their uh, about themselves, about their publications, about their teaching, about their research that's all manually entered uh, by that researcher themselves. And uh, again that's an, an area where researchers had to re-key in all the information about themselves which is actually captured in the different research information management systems around the university. So now we're implementing a, an automated profile system based on Vivo 
which will provide automated updates to researchers' profiles based on the different information that they have about their research, which is captured in the different systems. So all of the publication information about uh, the researchers will automatically be published in their external profile. And one of the benefits that the, uh, the library we're yet to see and we're hoping to see will really improve uh, the way we capture publication information is that researchers will look at their external profile and want to include missing reports or missing um, outputs, research outputs, and particularly non-traditional research outputs that aren't uh, normally captured as part of the harvesting from uh, information sources such as uh, Scopus and Web of Science and all those other information you know, providers that we have that feed into our, our harvesting solutions. So that's something where the, the visibility of that uh, research will be on our public profile pages. In the past, we haven't been able to do profile pages properly within our own uh, online institutional repository, and this is a, a much better solution tailored for the researchers themselves so that they can really promote their research and really show, uh, highlight what they're doing to help with that whole emphasis on uh, industry engagement and community engagement uh, externally. And so um, one of the interesting discussions around that aspect at our institution here is that um, there's been some discussion about well, what's the ro role of the repository after the profile system is out there. There was, there has been a sense um, through discussions with different areas of the institution about what the role of the repository is. And if all the research information is published externally through profiles, why do we need a repository? And it is, it does change the role of the repository in some ways but it also strengthens the role in the sense that the repository still is uh, really important in terms of information discovery and interoperability between repositories. Uh, the, the underlying open access versions of papers are very important to, to be able to have published online and the, the profile system will link back to the full text of that information either at the publisher's website or at the, for the open access version at, at, in the institutional repository. That'll be an interesting a uh, piece of work to link all that together and make that much more visible and engaging for people externally. Uh, the, the research information that we've also gathered through our repository, through harvesting, through our, the, the symplectic element system is also being used to provide that metadata to external uh, ranking agencies. So Latrobe uh, this year has been has achieved its highest ranking in all of the different uh, international external ranking profiles, um, and that's because our visibility of our research and our capture of our metadata about our research publications and research outputs has been uh, much more accurate, much higher than ever before, and that's partly because we've captured it in a better way and done it in a really efficient way for researchers. Uh, so that's one thing where the visibility of what the library's done has really uh, fed into improving outcomes for the university, but also uh, researchers themselves are doing more research and producing more papers and being more efficient at what they do. And the library's work has also helped uh, in terms of that process and freeing up researchers' time and enabling them to concentrate on what they do best, which is research. And the area of internal uh, research performance reporting is a really strong one as well. So each year uh, the university asks researchers to ensure that they, their, their publication history is up to date for every year for their new publications that they've published, including their uh, previous ones. And that is used for benchmarking against uh, other institutions to see where we're at in terms of what disciplines we publish in and how we rank in terms of impact and the number of publications produced in different disciplines and also the, the performance of each of the schools and departments in terms of uh, where they're supposed to be at in terms of how many outputs uh, are expected from researchers from their research each year, which is something like 1.5 uh, publications per researcher. So if we move to the next slide, I just want to uh, talk a bit about um, this process and collaboration with, um, I guess, our partners across the institution. 
So this is where um, the library sits in terms of gathering research outputs and feeding that into the research information within the, the institution. But we've had to be a partner with a range of departments across the institution in a much more collaborative way than we have in, in previous times because of the, uh, the visibility and the, the, the volume and the, the volume of information that the library is providing to feed into this process of ensuring that the information we provide is accurate and up to date and can be provided to all of the, to the central research information management system and then uh, providing information where it needs to go for all those, that different reuse and different uh, reporting and all those different areas that it's used within the institution. So HR data is, is becoming uh, much more important in terms of where that information, uh, making sure that information is accurate and up to date. We're having a discussion right now around do we provide ORCIDs uh, within the HR system? Is that where they sit? And should every time a new academic is uh, employed at the institution, do they bring their ORCID ID and possibly their Scopus ID and other IDs and provide that information immediately upon arriving at the institution and can that be fed, can that be kept in the HR system so that it follows them around and is always kept up to date. Now that's an interesting discussion at the moment. The ORCIDs are currently held within our symplectic elements um, solution and uh, is then used to you know, identify the researchers and make sure that we can uh, identify their publications automatically based on that ORCID ID. But really should it be uh, held within the, the HR system, it possibly should. And uh, La Trobe is also going through a process of re-evaluating uh, identifiers for its staff across the board uh, to help with issues like uh, single sign-on and identifying people uh, as they come and go and, and change roles within the institution because we might have, we often have people who are casual staff members, uh, they're also, they might be a PhD student um, and then they come and go and are re-employed in different roles and being able to have a single identifier for a person at La Trobe that persists across their career uh, is something we're also thinking about. Should that be an orchid or should it be something else? We um, I mentioned before, so things like uh, uh, grants, uh, grant management, applying for research grants, there's a role there in being able to provide all of this information to feed into a grant application. Um, so there's quite a bit of activity with looking at our research office and talking to uh, them about making sure that information is provided within the grants management system and that'll be part of the prime project next year and the year after in terms of being able to bring all that information together into the one system and keeping it up to date. Um, the issue of um, communications and um, outreach and, and presentation of research on the website is, is something that, that I see also as being becoming much more important. So pre the current researcher profiles pages on the university website, are, uh, the business owner for that is the, uh, the, the digital marketing people at the university who own the website essentially, the, the content management system. Um, and so we're working with them now to, uh, to under, so they understand how a researcher profiles page looks on the website and how, what it does in terms of promoting research, what it needs to, how, how people would engage with that those profiles and find that information, looking at metrics and usage, all those sort of things, that's becoming a much bigger conversation than we would have had previously. Uh, manual entry statements of impact down the bottom here is an interesting one also in that the, ex the ERA process for 2018, that's the Excellence for Research in Australia, government reporting also includes a, uh, an impact assessment um, component where uh, for La Trobe, we'll be picking a number of uh, disciplines where we will be uh, providing research statements and statements of impact of people's 
uh, research and community engagement and is industry engagement and how that's led to change in policy or change in practice in the community as part of our um, ERA submission uh, next year. And so therefore that issue around uh, altmetrics counting uh, the impact of publications, uh, counting uh, what reports are being used, unpublished reports, reports to, to government or industry or policy reports, it's really important to have that information captured so that uh, it can be counted and, and used in, in that kind of, of realm for showing the impact and, uh, of, of people's research. There's a question um, in the chat window. Um, are the external profiles just for researchers or other professional staff as well? That's a, a very good question. Um, at the moment we're limiting to, I believe we're limiting to academic staff and not necessarily professional staff, but we do capture publication information from all uh, staff and if there are HDR students who have also published, uh, we capture that information. So there's a bit of a discussion around um, who gets a profile and what that looks like on the on the external website. Uh, we're still figuring that out, I think. Uh, there's a question around uh, do we capture data and publication output for high degree research students in our symplectic elements system or the research information management system? Uh, it, yes, we do capture um, all research outputs for students and for staff and that's within the symplectic elements system and then that feeds into the, the central research information management system. Uh, there's also a question around ORCIDs um, and is there a connection between ORCIDs and outputs? Um, and are we including those ORCIDs in a repository and linking them together? Uh, in the repository, no, we're not at the moment, but that is something we want to do. And ORCIDs are, are included in our symplectic element system so that they can verify the identity of a person when the, the metadata states that this publication is attributed to this person. If, uh, if the publication metadata has that ORCID ID and the, the ORCID ID is within the profile of that, that um, academic within the symplectic element system, then it'll link them together. But uh, I, that, that is working well and uh, I think, but I think that needs to, uh, I guess, strengthen and improve um, in the future. Now I'd better move on to the next slide. Uh, this is, if you look at the, um, the, the paper we've written, there is a section there where we talk about um, what's the expertise that libraries have and how that fits into this process of research information management. So uh, these are the four kind of areas that we put them within and depending on what, how your library is structured and how you organise your work, you may have different people in different areas uh, contributing to this in a number of ways and I think it's, there's a really strong reason why libraries are involved because they, we do so much of these different areas that feed into research information management. So uh, I guess just briefly I'll say publications and scholarship expertise um, is something that we've had for quite some time in terms of what our librarians do um, and understanding uh, the, the publishing process and how we organise information but also uh, in terms of our repository staff, um, what the metadata looks like and what elements it needs to have in order to uh, be able to be accurate and attribute to uh, researchers and, and feed into this whole process. So that's a big focus for, for us and we have uh, repository staff who, who work in this area and um, have done that for quite some time. And we've put a lot of uh, effort into looking at ORCIDs and um, working on Scopus IDs, uh, looking at attribution, how we can improve that process of ensuring that, that the publications attributed to our academics are accurate and um, how we can improve that. The discoverability access and reputational support is also a really important one for the library. Um, some um, institutions provide uh, you know, a lot of effort in their uh, repositories around discoverability and access to that information. Some libraries also put a lot of effort into their library system and their search interface in order to uh, ensure that their own staff 
uh, their students and academics can find the information that they need. And this process kind of brings the two together in some ways because um, often they've been quite a separate piece of work from sep separate uh, areas in terms of um, ensuring that your repository is discoverable externally by the external community and perhaps uh, ensuring your internal, your library search interface is discoverable by your internal uh, students and staff. But this is where it, it kind of is merging a bit and bringing it all together I think is a really important one. And we're also looking at that, how we can strengthen this part of the process to bring it all together and, and improve the accuracy of the information we provide. Um, training and support obviously is a, an important one in terms of assisting the researchers to manage the research in their own publishing outputs and what they do with them, but also where to publish, uh, how that information helps them apply for grants and awards and a whole range of things around uh, you know, metrics and, and impact and, and publicising the work that they do. And then stewardship of the institutional record is uh, a really big one for the library and um, that may be around storage and uh, description of outputs, um, ensuring that the institutionals, uh, institutions outputs are, are managed properly because that's where they're going to be. Um, so I'll move on to the next slide and just cover a few couple of things uh, briefly. So why libraries? I think some of what I've said also explains uh, why libraries are involved because we have that expertise across the whole uh, publishing landscape from relationships with vendors to um, stewardship of the institutional record through our repositories, through harvesting of metadata and uh, looking at identifiers and, and those kind of things. Uh, you may be wondering what that image is. That's uh, Syracuse University Library. That's the original bird library at Syracuse. And um, one of our collaborators, Annie Rao, she um, is from Syracuse University Library and she's provided a couple of examples of some information that I'll talk about on the next couple of slides. So uh, that may be what, how you think of a librarian, I'm not quite sure, but I think the what, li what library staff do and how we're viewed and how our work feeds into what the institution does is really changing a lot from what you can see there to what we've been talking about today. And disambiguation I think is a really interesting one. Uh, we've all got stories of how uh, we've worked through to try and make that work better. Um, this is an example of some uh, people who are from Syracuse University and elsewhere who are all family members. And when you look at that cloud on the bottom right, a computer will just see what it, sh it shows there. So Jay Dannenhofer is common to all of those people and just disambiguating all of that and making sure that we have their publications assigned to the right people is quite a bit of work. Uh, these are all cousins and siblings and you know all that kind of thing, spouses, it's a, it's a big issue. Uh, and if we look at the information landscape, uh, these are the vendors that we deal with and I think uh, some of us, depending on our institution, are in one or a range of these camps. So at the moment La Trobe is in on that left one with digital science in terms of symplectic elements, altmetric and fig share. Uh, some institutions are using Elsevier products with Pura and Scopus and uh, Plum Analytics and repository solutions like BE Press and, uh, and the Mendeley software as well. And then uh, uh, all of us involved in the ERA process for 2018 are, are dealing with Clarivate Analytics in terms of Web of Science uh, citation data and how that feeds into this process as well. So lots of different vendors who are also uh, scrambling within this space, I suppose, and it's up to us in, as libraries to help them understand what we need from this process and how to improve their, the accuracy of their metadata. So Rebecca, I've gone on for a bit long, but I'm going to pass back over to you. Okay. All right. Thanks, Simon. Uh, that was very interesting. I think we have one question so far that we'll get to at the very end, and I think we'll have time for that. If, if others of you have questions, please feel free to enter those into the chat window. I'm going to quickly talk about some future research and also encourage uh, you to participate in some ways. We do have a research um, report that is coming out either late this week or early next. Uh, and 
in this, uh, two of my OCLC research colleagues, uh, in collaboration with folks from LIBER, the uh, Association of European Research Libraries, have done case studies of Finland, Germany, and the Netherlands. And we did interviews with about 20 different institutions, as well as with persistent identifier organizations like ISNI and ORCID to understand what is the adoption of research information management in these landscapes, and then also what is the adoption of integration of, of identifiers like ORCID and ISNI with, within this. Uh, so that's coming soon. Um, it will be available through OCLC um, through the link that you see there. Uh, and as always, our research is available openly so anybody can access it. The last thing I want to mention is that um, this is the third part in this arc of research we're doing here is a survey on research information management practices. It is currently live and it has been developed uh, by members of the OCLC Research Library Partnership, as well as uh, collaborators from EuroCRIS, which is the association of CRIS managers within uh, Europe and beyond. Um, our goal is to collect as many responses from as many different institutions worldwide as we can. Uh, it's currently open. I want to quickly talk about this. We've structured this very much to be, you know, about the who, what, where, and why of, uh, of um, what is happening with research information management. And I'm going to quickly sort of go through those. Um, we're interested in institutions that may be at any stage of research information management adoption. We also, we're interested in those institutions that may just be collecting uh, a research, researcher faculty bibliography sort of simple, uh, and it, or you may have um, a staff that's supporting this and, you know, a lot of training, et cetera. Or you may be in the process of acquiring. It doesn't matter if you don't have what you think of as a system or that you aren't live. We still want to hear from you because it, I think you can still offer us an, an important data point in how this is evolving. Um, we also want to understand and to get a better sense of what the drivers are worldwide. Um, we have this model um, that we've developed for um, research REM uses, um, which also goes into the how, but it also it comes from the why. Uh, and I know from talking with people, and I, I and but it's also very anecdotal. So what we're hoping is to move from anecdote to evidence with this research. Uh, and then also to really understand how institutions are using, which of these uses they're using it for, and then the stuff that you're probably most interested in is what systems are you using? At what stage of interoperability are you? Um, where are you harvesting metadata from? Who is included? Are grad students included? Uh, questions that you ask today. These are the types of questions we're asking. Do you have interoperability with your repository? Um, uh, what kinds of, uh, are you using ORCID IDs? Are you using other standards, et cetera? Uh, and also we want to get a sense of, um, and this is part of our service as OCLC research, we want to understand what the role of the library is within this. What kinds of staff resources are being dedicated, and how is the library serving its role? Um, because we see anecdotally a range of activities from uh, zero to almost completely managing the entire thing. So we're interested in getting a better sense of that. We've been promoting this through every way we can think of. Uh, in a, um, but the challenge is, is that the right person for this to identify, um, might be in the library, might be in the research office, might be in the provost office. Uh, so we're asking you today to be thinking and help identify on behalf of your institution who should be taking this survey. Because we invite all research supporting institutions, universities, medical centers, research institutes, to complete a survey about their institution regardless of where they are. Uh, and we're planning to close the survey January 15th uh, next month uh, and then 
our working group will return, synthesize the findings, and we will be publishing those, like all research reports that we offer for OCLC, those will be published uh, CC BY, and we'll also be publishing the accompanying data set as well. So in other words, it's your turn actually to share what you're doing and to participate in the research as well. So we encourage you to share. Um, we have about five minutes left for questions. I see somebody has completed the survey. Thank you. I love hearing that. Actually, when I had data from about a month ago, and it's the last report I had, I should get another one probably tomorrow, um, we had no Australian institutions. So I'm hoping um, our numbers will, will uh, surge after this. Our head of our research office at La Trobe um, noticed the survey and uh, without me pointing it out to her, so she hopefully is going to fill that in from our point of view, so that'll be interesting. Good. Uh, Rebecca has shared a couple of links uh, during the course of this webinar um, and also talked about a, a new report that's going to be coming out quite shortly uh, because you've attended the webinar, um, because we have your contact information. We will be sending you both a link to the recording to this webinar and also those, uh, those links for other resources, including the survey. So you will be sure to have that, um, that information close, close at hand. But if you want to uh, scribble down oc.lc slash rim, that will also get you to all of that, uh, that good stuff. Um, I see that we have, um, we have one question outstanding from M. Johnson. Uh, would you be able to share, or would you be willing, Simon, to share your planning around the changes to repository purpose, function, and focus as you move more into OA workflows as Elements is implemented? I think this is a, a forecasting forward question. Yeah, I've asked M to um, email me about that because um, it's been a, an evolving thing. Um, you know, to say we have uh, sort of clearly defined uh, I guess processes around that and, and documentation around that is probably not the case. It's um, it's really been uh, a discussion with our research office about how we do this work and what we wanted to do and and what the the reasons were uh, for doing it and and improving uh, the way things uh, will occur. So it's been a, a process that's taken probably. Uh, you know, a couple of years of discussion and investigation, and then we did put up a, a proposal to uh, change uh, and acquire our symplectic elements system. Um, so I can share uh, that, uh, you know, with uh, with people in terms of the business case, and then it's sort of been an evolving uh, effort since then. I'd say. Okay, great. I am not seeing um, any more questions at this time. Um, uh, I will give it just another minute um, and also take the time to thank you for both your uh, attendance and participation in this webinar um, and to remind you that we will be posting a recording of the webinar online and we'll also notify you by email when the recording is available. Um, Rebecca, do you have any, Rebecca or Simon, do you have any other final thoughts uh, as we as we close out? Nothing else for me. Just take the survey. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, contact us. Uh, contact me on email if you want to ask any questions. That's no problem at all. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much to uh, to our presenters and again to our great audience for getting in there and asking questions. I know sometimes it can be a little difficult in this virtual environment. Um, I'm pleased to return two minutes of your day to you, so use them wisely. Uh, thank you, Simon and Rebecca, and this concludes today's webinar. Thanks.